everyone. Today is a lovely day and during the spring and summertime I'm so fortunate at Niagara College that I get to work on a variety of different education related initiatives. Over the past few years I've been able to work with um, Global Affairs Canada, with Elenia, with um, SICAN on different initiatives related to teaching and learning and it's pretty exciting for me as a food scientist to think both about the epistemology of how we do food science and how we think about systems. So I just enjoy it very much and this is one of the reasons that I keep this YouTube channel. So today we're going to be talking about more about um, competency-based education and training and how do we understand these systems? How do we use competency-based education and training platforms to design curriculum? And then we'll be applying that to food science-based concepts. So Watch out, I've got a couple videos coming down the pipeline today and we'll have some fun with this. So I'll join you in PowerPoint in just a moment. So today we're talking about competency-based education systems, or you may hear me use the term CBET, Competency-Based Education and Training, C-B-E-T. CBET is a very influential um, education system and it's gaining a lot of traction because when we really think about what is the purpose of post-secondary education, there's been a lot of dialogue about it being um, expansive for the mind and, and preparing people for uh, preparing people for the future. But if we really think about it fundamentally, most people who are going into post-secondary education are doing it because they aim to get a job and they're selecting programs because they see that post-secondary education is formative for being able to get that job. And as such, it goes back to what are the skills necessary for the job? And that's where competency comes into play. So following along here, I don't, I'm not going to use one of my CBET type slides, but uh, many of the students laugh uh, from my other videos saying, usually your second slide is, in this video, you will learn how to do. And so in this video, we will learn uh, about uh, we'll, gain, we'll gain some knowledge and understanding about CBET systems globally and build some context with relation to food science programming uh, in Canada and in a variety of other countries. So I didn't make a slide. This is a presentation that I had given previously for a program with Global Affairs Canada and um, the Vietnam Skills for Employment Project, which uh, was hosted in Vietnam over the uh, past five years and wrapped up in um, late 2019. So. Food science education is not standardized in Canada. We haven't set some clear um, frameworks about what that education system needs to look like. In Vietnam, uh, we found that at, at the time there was not any standardization of what the curriculum needed to be. It's interesting. I'm working on a project right now with um, SICAN Colleges and Institutes Canada and what's called the um, Skills to uh, Access the Green Economy program, the SAGE program. And Jamaica is actually a really interesting case because there is some standardization and their their Council of Community Colleges in Jamaica, CCCJ, has developed some occupational standards, which, which makes it really interesting. Are those occupational standards um, meeting CBET requirements? Uh, in some cases, partly, and in other cases, that's what we're working on to improve. It's difficult to benchmark skills unless we have gone through and asked those key questions. What do you need to do to be successful on the job? And in food science, there's so many different career pathways. Very few people graduate from a food science program and become a food scientist. Most of us become other allied professionals in food safety management, in quality assurance, quality control, perhaps in manufacturing systems, perhaps advanced manufacturing or automation. Other people go into research and development or product development. Some people end up in marketing. And, and as such, all of these diverse competencies are difficult to deliver in a singular program. And that's something that we need to be aware of and uh, make sure that we are uh, managing within our CBET framework. But let's jump back here. What is an occupational competency? Because we are talking about competency. Well. According to the Canadian Labour Force and Development Board, their definition is a competency is a description of what people or individuals have to do and know 
to perform various tasks or jobs. And UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uses the definition, a competency is a set of skills related to knowledge and attributes that allow an individual to successfully perform a task or an activity within a specific function of her job. And so what is competency? It's where we are going through and, and describing in realistic detail what does someone need to be able to do to fulfill a job. And we need to be able to describe it and we need to be able to define the level of understanding or rigor or relevance of that task and there's a there's a there's a uh, almost an art to doing this because you need to build these competencies not so specific that um, someone doesn't have transferable skills from one workplace to the other but at the same time they have to have enough granular detail that you know what you need to be teaching or you know what you need to have accomplished as a student now, what is competency-based curriculum? Well, using UNESCO's definition, UNESCO is the United Nations Education, Science, and Cultural Organization. They have a, what's called their International Bureau of Education. And their definition of competency-based curriculum is that there's a primary emphasis on complex outcomes of a learning process and defined abilities after learning. So we have to think very deliberately, what is that student able to do? Defined ability after the learning activity. We also need to make sure that we are uh, codifying the knowledge, skills, and ad attitudes that need to be applied by our learners. We need to be less focused on traditionally defined subject content. So I often use the example where I say, are, are you a textbook teacher? And inevitably, lots of teachers have done this, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to call anyone out here, but it's easy to just say, hey, you know what, we've got a textbook here and there's 12 chapters and we've got 14 weeks of the semester, so one chapter, one chapter a week and uh, one week for midterm and one week for final exam. That's not how most courses or need to be taught, they, especially within CBEC. You need to be focused on how do you define the occupational tasks and not how is a textbook defined. Most students are not going out to be textbook authors. <laughs> we need to make sure that anything that we're doing within a seabed environment is learner-centered and adapted to the changing needs of students, teachers, and society. And so this is, uh, this is going to be the conversation we have over the next few uh, PowerPoints, is how do we go about that process of figuring out what those adaptive needs are for the students, the teachers, and for society or the industry? And how do we go about predicting some of the trends that are coming down the pipeline? And for us as members of the education community, how do we respond to those trends and define our curriculum in adaptive ways so that we are um, not just needing the, uh, the needs of the industry at this moment, but we're predicting five or 10 years into the future so that our students, by the time they graduate, are prepared for that new future, which is the new today. We do want to make sure that we're choosing learning activities that um, they're chosen with a, a great level of deliberation so that learners can acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to situations they encounter in everyday life. And we're making the assumption that everyday life is not just everyday family life at home, but everyday life in their job. And so we have to think deliberately, what are the types of jobs that they're going to be getting um, within a short period after graduation. So usually we say there's immediate after graduation and then within two to five years, what sort of uh, careers are they going to mature into and progress with um, in that, that early stage career progression? And that's going to help us define what those defined abilities and defined occupational tasks are going to be so that we know and are able to prepare our students for success. The photo here just happens to be um, a program advisory committee meeting that we were hosting with our team at Vinlong Community College in, in Vinlong City, Vietnam. And uh, these are different members of the industry. And you can see off in the background our, our um, learning outcomes that we had been defining with our, with our team, uh, going through a consensus building activity where um, the members of this committee were working on figuring out what those tasks were, what do those workers do, and 
making sure that we then organize those into logical frameworks for teaching within the classroom. So some, some uh, key hallmark that we find in uh, competency-based education is the use of um, a taxonomy of thinking skills. And this is a taxonomy that was originally developed by um, a researcher uh, called Benjamin Bloom, and he focused his research on uh, mostly on uh, childhood education. But the idea was that you have these... Um, um, almost a, a hierarchy of skills. And so the idea is that at the beginning, you focus on acquisition of knowledge. So you need to remember and understand core concepts, but then you start to go into application where you can use those concepts in a meaningful way within the context of the occupation. And then you can add on layers of complexity. So these higher order thinking skills. So where we're analyzing or evaluating or creating. And oftentimes uh, it's tempting as educators to say, well, these higher order thinking skills are, are relegated only to higher order jobs or higher order levels of the education uh, environment. So it's tempting as educators to say, hey, wait a second, let's just focus on these low order skills for our first and second semester and then focus on high order thinking skills for later semesters. Um, within CBET, we actually typically try as fast as possible to get into this application phase and move as quickly as possible to higher order thinking skills. And it's, it always, it, it, it's, it's one of these lovely debates I have with different faculty members is doing different projects but uh, they often say, well, um, unskilled workers don't have the capability of doing these higher order thinking skills. And I disagree quite, quite strongly about that. I use the example of hand washing. Do people under, like, do they remember, I need to wash my hands? Do they understand why? Can they wash their hands? We don't necessarily need to... Um, focus on this before we start teaching people that it's important to follow good manufacturing practices with respect to personnel hygiene. We go straight to the application phase. Here's how you wash your hands. Let's wash our hands. But then going into some of these higher order thinking skills uh, it, within the food manufacturing environment, you can start asking your employees. If you, for example, suddenly did not have water available to wash your hands, what would you need to do within the, within the food manufacturing environment? Do you need to shut your facility down? Do you need to call in a plumber? Do you need to um, find other methods to access water so that you can continue your operations? These are s some of these creative thinking skills. Or what would be an effective hand washing uh, system within our facility? Could we, if we were to have the opportunity to invest in better, better systems, what would that look like? These are, these are very high order thinking skills, but it all relates back to, am I washing my hands or not? And honestly, this is the sort of thing that uh, is really, really important to contextualize. These high order thinking skills are available to any learner when the curriculum is structured appropriately with the right rigor and the right relevance to the learner and where they are in their zone of proximal development. So, Within CBET, we are under the assumption that um, as fast as possible, we're, we're, we're jumping to this application and higher order thinking skills as fast as possible. We are not dwelling in this bottom end with the low order thinking skills. This is also a great way to inspire engagement within the classroom. And a hallmark of CBET education is the amount of practical laboratories and practical exercises and case studies and work integrated learning as part of the education environment because we're going straight to application and we're building out those structures uh, knowing that initially when students are applying it, they're going to be applying it in very simple ways. But then as they're gaining confidence with those skills, they're going to apply it in much more complex ways and able to move into these higher order mastery skills. Now something else about uh, uh, CBET education is that when we're thinking about this Bloom's taxonomy perspective, 
usually in the education sector, we're thinking about the acquisition of uh, knowledge, that cognitive domain that people have ideas about how things are done and they've got facts and figures in their mind. But there are other aspects. So psychomotor, I always, I, I, I always jump to psychomotor uh, as my first example. Psychomotor is the doing of different skills. So for example, in the case of um, food safety, or food, uh, or food science, for example, our, our students may be becoming quality assurance technicians, and they may need to know how to prepare reagents within the laboratory for doing um, quality assurance analysis, or they may need to be preparing reagents for microbiology. Microbiology has a lot of psychomotor skill sets where you actually have to physically manipulate things and maintain aseptic environments. And as such, there's a muscle memory that's involved in that process. And so psychomotor has its own taxonomy as well, where you are um, learning a skill, but then uh, being able to assimilate that skill into a much higher level of, of repeatability to the point that it's a natural activity for that person. Another domain is this uh, affective domain or the emotional and psychosocial aspects of doing that job. And Often in science and technology fields, we don't think about the affective domain enough, but um, food safety, for example, has a lot of affective domain where we are thinking about working with integrity, not, um, not doing fraudulent behaviors, ensuring that we are doing tasks uh, completely and effectively, having emotional intelligences to work with teams or to um, respond with... Um, with, uh, I want to say, justice and fairness when working with employees. These are affective domain uh, uh, areas that we need to be thinking about and encouraging our students to um, explore as part of the learning process. And so as food science teachers, we need to think about all three of these domains with a, with a strong level of deliberation when thinking about our CBET curriculum. This is a, a little bit of a breakdown of, of these taxonomies, and there are entire verb charts of these taxonomies. But uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Bloom was the first uh, group, but uh, Kratwall has done a lot of additional research, and with the Anderson and Kratwall is the most uh, modern version of the, the cognitive domain application. But uh, as you mentioned, in the case of that cognitive domain, you're starting with remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. But within the effective, we're receiving emotions or, or, or um, feelings or intelligences. We're responding, we're valuing, we're then organizing and conceptualizing, and we're characterizing values. And in the case of psychomotor, we're imitating a skill, then we're manipulating, we're doing it with precision, we're doing it with articulation, and then we've naturalized that skill. And so, again, in, in food science, we have a lot of these domains um, integrated into our work. And we need to be uh, really cognizant of designing curriculum that responds to all of these domains. Now, in the case of uh, building out a CBET uh, framework within an organization, this is, a, this is a slide from the Institute of Education Sciences in the United States, and I do like this slide very much. Um, I'm not going to read out the whole slide here, but uh, I, I, when, I, when I look at the slide, I actually jump to this second column first. And there's a reason why I'm jumping out there, in that within an organization, you need to build out that organizational mandate for doing CBET. And so you have to have that institutional mission and create the professional development for your staff to um, implement CBET practices. If, if you have a lone teacher trying to do CBET and everyone else is doing traditional didactic read from the textbook teaching, it's going to be hard uh, culturally to maintain that. Whereas if you have buy-in from your senior leadership and they are encouraging people to do this, and building out the systems within uh, the uh, building out the innovation with uh, the stakeholders and the parents and families and, and so on, that's going to 
uh, encourage adoption of CBET type practices much, much faster. And it's going to build out norms for how to implement this. From there, then you need to think about the physical aspects of the structure. So what does this look like from a logistics and uh, management perspective within your institution. So how are you doing assessment? How how are you managing classroom or, or as they use the term seat time? Can can a student, for example, um, take the learning, uh, register for the course, take all of the, the course materials, but then challenge out that course through prior learning assessment and recognition? Or can they just come and challenge the competencies and not have to sit in the in the classroom that whole time. That that's that's an uh, an interesting scenario that a lot of us discuss quite a bit. How are you using learning management systems or internet-based software to uh, manage the learning content that's related to your courses? How are you doing scheduling? How are you how are you defining competency? We'll talk about that in a moment. How do you encourage professional development for your faculty and staff? And how do you make sure that you've got that physical infrastructure? So CBET. Um, as, as we've alluded to, there's a lot of practical learning with laboratories or case studies or um, workplace type scenarios that you want to be using as part of that learning environment. And so that traditional desk, chair, um, chalkboard type classroom, while it still has value, it may not be representative of the types of learning environments that you need. And so you've got you've to gotta be able to integrate that more fully. From a teaching perspective, you have to start to have that mind shift with your teachers that the teachers, yes, they are subject matter experts and they are participating in a major aspect of knowledge transfer to the students and learners, but they are also coaching and mentoring and providing a lot of facilitation so that the students are uh, facilitating a lot of their own learning. And the teacher also has to have an aspect of understanding that personalization, that each student comes in with their own individualized zone of proximal development. And you need to, as a teacher, figure out how can I both create learning environment that has some sort of uniformity so that I'm not customizing everything and everything, while at the same time responding to the fact that each student may come with different um, initial start point in terms of uh, skills and competencies to be able to participate in that class. And as such, there needs to be that flexibility. From a teaching perspective, you, you have to think creatively about how are you building out tools and resources for teaching. And uh, I, I always joke that this YouTube channel is one of my tools and resources for teaching. It's, it's my way of creating a, a, a curriculum that can be uh, taken out of a linear context and applied in all sorts of different ways. Building out assessments uh, that are meaningful within the competency evaluation, that it, it deserves its own, uh, it deserves its own uh, whole uh, YouTube video or PowerPoint because assessment design for competency-based um, learning is a, it's a real art form to make sure that you are truly proving that you not only have have taught that, but you've assessed it and you've assessed it to the right level of mastery within that taxonomy. Last but not least, the learning process. How are you making sure that the students are engaging in that process in a meaningful way and they're owning it and they're able to participate in a really active way such that they can learn anytime and anywhere, that they can be uh, participating and that they can be encouraging each other as students within that learning process. Now, this is another taxonomy that I often work with um, when doing curriculum design with people, and it's called the Rigor Relevance Framework, and it was developed by ICLE. And the idea is that it's, it's two-dimensional, that you've got Bloom's taxonomy, and that, that taxonomy that we've just spent the past few minutes talking about, but now you're also thinking about how are you um, going about that application and adding that secondary dimension. So are you just applying it in a very narrow field within one discipline or one type of scenario? But then are you able to start applying it in much more complex ways? So are you applying it in real world but predictable situations? Or now are you throwing in a lot of um, chaos into the situation and 
adding unpredictability. That's where if a student is able to be in that reflexive mode, that is where you're um, building out a, a different domain of, of application. And so you can have low level, um, or low level knowledge taxonomies, but capabilities of applying those uh, lower level uh, knowledge taxonomies in meaningful ways. I use the example of, um, oftentimes I'm working with management type students or um, people who are going to go into food manufacturing leadership. They may need to know that a system exists, but as a manager, they may not need to be in a high level of um, a high level of comprehension of that of that skill because they are going to instead, as managers, as executives, be enabling scientific specialists to then be uh, fulfilling their job. Maybe they're employing engineers or sanitation specialists or R and D leaders within their organization. Those individuals need to have a different level of uh, knowledge taxonomy on the skills, but the manager needs to know and be able to apply it in real-world unpredictable situations. And so this is the this is the dynamic that is at play in some in, so in some cases you've got to think: Does this person need to be able to do it and do everything, or do they just need to know that it is there and be able to use it in in complex uh, in complex ways? But not necessarily be a master of it, and that that's that's an even more complex thought process. Now, in CBAC curriculum design, there is this relational aspect between our students and our industry, but uh, uh, we have to think that it all hinges back on the educators as the curators of that dialogue. And so we do need to be really aware, what do those students need? And we, we have to think about who is that archetypal student? Is it someone who's coming from high school? Is it a mature student who's been in the workforce and is coming back to retrain? Um, is it someone who maybe never completed uh, traditional um, secondary or even primary education, but needs to gain workforce ready skills? We need to think realistically about what that student need experience is so that we are designing our content and designing our classroom experience to meet those students where they're at. I think about uh, the COVID situation where we had to immediately pivot to online learning and many of our students didn't have reliable internet access. And so we had to find creative ways that the students could go to hubs or go to places where they could get Wi-Fi and be able to download content so they could watch it later on um, within the environment that they were most comfortable at. They didn't want to sit in the parking lot and do their studies. What the students needed as well was flexibility. That um, During COVID, many of, many of our students in food science were able to quickly go and pivot and work in food manufacturing and would work an eight-hour day, but then if they were told that they needed to attend a class at two o'clock in the afternoon, but they could have the chance to be working, they, they'd they say, well, can I access this, uh, this lecture material as a recorded content? That aspect of really authentically saying to the students, what do the students need? And for us as educators to respond to it, that's important by, uh, admittedly, you have to sometimes push back to the students and say, hey, you know what, you signed up for this and you have committed to making it a priority, but any time where we can use logical and uh, realistic ways of increasing accessibility, we should be doing that rather than pushing back and saying, hey, you know what, you signed up for this, this class is at two o'clock and you should be there despite the fact that you may also need to be making an income or you may have kids in school. We do need to be responding to what does the industry need. And so going out and participating in an occupational task assessment, that's going to be my next video, but uh, figuring out what are those tasks that people are doing in industry? How are they doing it? How are they applying the technology or the scientific knowledge? And what are the sorts of relational skills that are out there? Now, it's not that we need to be going down to a granular level. I, I keep thinking about... Uh, one year I got I got an email from an alumni uh, who had, who had uh, recently got a job and they were like, 
You know, I really liked your chemistry class, Amy, but uh, I really wished I had learned how to use this pH meter from company XYZ. And I'm like, um, we taught you about how to use operating procedures and manuals so that you could learn how to use any piece of equipment. Well, I had to, it was so hard for me to learn how to use, and I'm like, how do we make sure that we are uh, responding in a, in a meaningful way? From my perspective, I had built out the learning outcome such that we were focused on how do we use operating procedures for equipment and how do we find those operating procedures? How do we follow them? How do we connect with equipment manufacturers so that we can effectively use any piece of equipment versus how do we learn model XYZ pH meter? That, I think, is important to have a bit of that dialogue back and forth to make sure that the learning outcomes that we are representing within our, within our curriculum are responsive to what the industry needs while still being adaptive and not so narrowly focused unless that's an absolutely, um, if it's a skill that's done the same way every single time by every single industry, then teach it that way. Whereas if it is something that's done in a different way each time, think about building in that adaptability and um, I want to, uh, that creative mindset into the teaching and learning outcomes. So as educators, we have a strong role to play in terms of building out this relationship between the students, the industry, and ourselves. We also have a role to play um, with respect to extension. I realize in some countries there are formal extension processes, but those of us who are working in post-secondary education, we de facto become a bit of an informal extension model that we are preparing those workers who are going to join the industry. And in, in many cases, we can change the, um, we can change the expectations of how the industry functions through how we teach and through building out that critical mass of graduates entering into the workforce. So for example, at Niagara College, um, back when I was designing the curriculum 10 years ago, we did a comparative analysis against other food science curriculum around the world, and it was very common for HACCP and food safety management systems to be a final year, often a final semester course. And it was always thought, well, this is a higher order learning process. Let's, let's leave it until the end of the program because the students need to have that foundational knowledge. And we said, well, wait a second, couldn't they be learning that foundational knowledge right within a food safety course? And so we put our introductory HACCP course in semester one. And then we were repeating those skills across all of the different courses so many times that the level of mastery within that taxonomy and the ability to apply HACCP principles of, across a wide variety of unpredictable situations meant that our students had a much broader grasp of HACCP than many of their um, many of their colleagues and in many cases the students would go out into the workforce and quickly become the HACCP coordinator in companies because their skills were so well developed and that became a game changer in terms of the post-secondary landscape in in Ontario as well as changing the expectations of the industry saying wait a second if we look for the right graduates. We don't need to be sending our students out for all of these introductory training courses. We should be expecting that students know this. This is this this should be part of the education and curriculum. And that sort of uh, creative and innovative mindset is is something that the education sector can do, but it takes a lot of vision and it takes a lot of courage to be able to step into that sort of space and advocate for your rationale. So how do we get ready to do this? Well, as we mentioned before, you've got to think methodically about this. So you've got to figure out who is your typical student and what is that typical graduate going to look like? So going out and talking to employers, talking to alumni, talking to um, the, your workforce development office to figure out what are the sorts of jobs that are out there and what sorts of skills are being done in those jobs. Then you've got to dig in and figure out what 
is that occupational task assessment. We'll talk about that in the next PowerPoint, but you've got to start interviewing people, start looking at job descriptions, start perhaps even going on field trips to observe these people doing the job that they say that they're doing to figure out what those tasks are. And we'll talk about what's involved in an occupational task assessment in the next PowerPoint. And then you've got to think as a subject matter expert designing curriculum, what are those opportunities for innovation that are going to be both transformative for the students as well as transformative for the industry? Another example of how we did transformative work at Niagara College was that uh, we noticed in Canada that many of our food businesses, um, actually the large percentage of our food businesses are small, independently run businesses. And as such, we needed to not just have really strong technical expertise, but we needed to have generalist workers who had experience in business, in marketing, in finance, in um, entrepreneurship. And we built some courses into our program that focus on those innovation skill sets as well as financial skill sets so that our students could go out into, into business leadership if that was a dimension of the work that they wanted to do. And so that, again, that growth mindset, what does the industry need and who are those workers so that they're going to be successful in their workplace? And so that's, I want to say, a really quick high-level summary of what's going to be involved. We're going to dig into each of these, these um, core topics in some further PowerPoints in just a moment. But I, I do want to jump out in my next PowerPoint and talk about what does occupational task assessment look like from a, a curriculum design perspective so that we can start to quantify and describe what those tasks are so that we can then build it into our curriculum and use good taxonomy in that process. So I think um, this is my last slide here, but we do need to be aware in certain circumstances, different countries have national occupational standards. And this is something that if you are designing curriculum, you need to take the time and reach out to the Ministry of Education or your relevant government agency to find out if there are national occupational standards. And in some cases, there are also privately run accreditation frameworks that help define what a, a competency might look like. So I realize that this doesn't... Um, the uh, in, certain, in certain trades or in certain uh, skilled professions like nursing... There are expectations from uh, colleges of practice. So in, in Ontario, we have a college of nursing that helps define what those occupational standards are, and that then defines what the educational standards are going to be. In Canada, it's been a voluntary process for accreditation on a, a variety of different food professions, but there's been some big initiatives. Food Processing Skills Canada and Employment and Social Development Canada have invested heavily in building out some of these benchmarks. So do make sure to take the time to find out what sort of voluntary or uh, government-oriented occupational standard frameworks might be in place because that may help improve your, your uh, curriculum design process. So watch for our next video and we'll talk to you again real soon.